And much of what we call cognition, and this I think really has come a, a, um, to the fore as a result of work in psychology as well as neuroscience, much of what we call cognition is really skill. I think we went into the early stages of cognitive science using language as a model for knowledge in general. And we thought of knowledge as being essentially propositional. But mostly it isn't like that. Mostly it's a skill. Spatial skills, skills for navigating the causal world to, know, to understand the causal structure of that part of the world that's relevant to my survival. I don't think I need to say anything very much about this, uh, except I suppose we are amongst a small minority of Americans who do think, or a small minority of humans, who do think that mental phenomena are nothing other than phenomena of the physical brain. Um, there is no non-physical soul that does the thinking and the feeling and so forth. It's an illusion of the brain to think that we do. And it's a very powerful and perhaps a very useful illusion. And the self, both the sense of self and the self-representation of the body, the self-representation of one as having a past and as having a future, the self-representation that's involved as animals conceive of goals and plans and carry them out, they are all, one and all, just constructs of the brain. I'm not really going to say very much about consciousness, except that uh, I have, although I like the, the, the take on it that Christoph and, and Francis have, for some reason, I guess I'm just kind of a stubborn person, but I just kind of look at it in a slightly different way. Um, okay, am I pressing the button? or Yes, I'm pressing the button, but there we go. And this came up earlier this morning, and, and I, I think Sydney and I were at least in some degree of, of agreement. I tend to think that the problem of consciousness is, is really analogous to the problem that people faced at the turn of the century about what is life. And as you know, of course, some people thought that the, that the answer, well, what's the difference between a dead thing and a live thing, that the answer could only be uh, élan vital, that there is some sort of vital spirit. And perhaps some people looked for uh, the vital correlates, you might say, uh, of livingness. And I don't think the vital correlates of livingness strategy, with all due respect, I don't think that was the strategy that taught us about what life is. It turned out it came from a huge amount of work from uh, cell biology, understanding the nature of membranes, of ATP, of energy use. Uh, it, it came out of understanding molecular biology and how proteins get built and so on and so forth. And it's very interesting that it wasn't that people finally said, you know, well, we now have the answer to what life is. It's just that question doesn't get asked anymore because this huge amount of basic cellular and uh, uh, of cellular physiology and anatomy makes that question no shows. And I have the feeling, and I could be totally wrong about this, that consciousness is a bit like that. The disanalogy is with something like what is fermentation where there was a project, an answer was achieved, and we knew what the answer. I don't think that the question about consciousness is like that. There, there isn't, in my opinion, likely to be a single answer. And although I think in some ways Christoph probably agrees with me because we both agree that you can start with what it's not. It's not. Consciousness is not in existence in any of those instances. And that there are a range of phenomena, although we tend perhaps to focus on awareness of visual phenomena. And we saw today the spectacular work of uh, Richard Axel on, uh, on sensory of, of olfactory phenomena. But there is also, of course, imagery. There are these rather more diffuse things like feeling well or ill or energetic 
we're aware of spatial relations, we're aware of temporality, we're aware of ourselves as agents, partly because we have efforts copy. So the indirect approach is that we need to really understand a whole lot of functions, uh, some of which I list here. But in addition to that, this is the part of the talk where I want to say that I, of course, am one of the people who is, is very thrilled and excited by the kind of developments we've seen in neuroscience, especially over the last two or three decades, because we really do see all kinds of places where the traditional philosophical questions are being ushered into the neurobiological laboratories, and that's a wonderful thing. But I also want to emphasize, and this is something that also came out this morning, that there are major issues that are not yet understood and resolved within neuroscience. And I'll try and quickly go through these without pausing for a long discussion. We do not yet understand how information is coded in neurons. It is true that tremendous progress has been made, especially in sensory systems. But bear in mind that there are many instances where there is a representation in the nervous system, but there is no stimulus. Let me give you an example from, uh, I'm going to go forward and then I'm going to want to go back, that we saw this morning. Um, we see the brain, the visual system represents a line of the triangle. It isn't there. So there is nothing in the stimulus to which that line corresponds. Similarly, in the case of so-called subjective motion, where a light goes off here and comes off here, and you see uh, a line moving. There is nothing in the stimulus to which the activity of an MT neuron corresponds when it signals that it's aware of or that it's uh, responding to motion. 